The views and opinions expressed in this program are not necessarily those of Union Broadcasting Incorporated, ESPN Kansas City, or its employees. The host is solely responsible for the on-air content. The following program is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice. Investing in ETFs involves risk, including potential loss of principal. Any past performance figures discussed are not necessarily indicative of future results. Visit ETFstore.com for more information. Now it's time for the ETF Store Show. The investment pros at the ETF Store discuss everything you need to know about exchange-traded funds and the world of investing. Whether you're an investing expert or just starting out, Nate and Jason will help you get up to date on what's happening on Wall Street and show you how exchange-traded funds can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and allow you to take advantage of investment opportunities around the world. And now, the host of the ETF Store Show, Nate Geraci. Welcome to the ETF Store Show. Nate Geraci and Jason Link in studio. As always, we are so glad to have you joining us today. In about 20 minutes, we'll be joined by Jeremy Schwartz, Director of Research at Wisdom Tree. Wisdom Tree is a top 10 ETF provider. And I would say one of the areas they're probably best known for is their international ETF lineup. In particular, their currency hedged and dividend weighted ETFs. And if you haven't heard Jeremy before, I, I've got to tell you, he's simply a tremendous all-around resource on the financial markets. You're going to find out uh, rather quickly just how plugged in he is to everything occurring uh, around the globe and certainly in the world of ETFs. Jason, there are two threads we're going to work on today's show. Uh, one is investing internationally, and the other is accessing that exposure using ETFs that take a, a bit of a different approach than plain vanilla market cap weighted ETFs. And I, I think this is timely because international stocks have had a strong year so far. They've handily outperformed U.S. stocks. And as we'll talk about, with growing concerns over U.S. stock valuations, there's a compelling case to be made to look internationally. And there's certainly no shortage of ETF options here. Well, it's interesting when you look at the year-to-date numbers, um, the S&P up you know, t around 10% year-to-date, but developed international around 16% emerging markets. I think that's an asset class that people may have a little underexposure to up over near, well, actually nearly 20%. Now, one of the problems with throwing out some of these eye popping numbers is that there's always going to be an indice somewhere that's better than your, that perform better than your portfolio. We get a little envy there. And, and, and most, most well thinking investors have a well diversified all weather portfolio. So, but it, it does, it does stand to reason that uh, if you suffer from a little home country bias and had that, those sectors that were underrepresented, you might not have got all the returns that you might have been entitled to you know we talk about home country bias so that's just a a behavioral just really a behavior that, that investors have they feel comfortable investing in their home region their home country they know the laws they know that it's a familiarity situation now to get international exposure, there are a lot of ways to do it. There is some unbelievable innovation in that space, in the ETS space specifically. So we'll be talking more about this with our guests later in the show. Yeah, and also uh, later in the program, after Jeremy joins us, uh, Jason, you and I are going to spotlight a couple of unique Wisdom Tree ETFs that uh, focus on individual countries. And I think both of these provide really good examples of that innovation as well. Uh, as always, if you have questions or comments for us, you can email advice at etfstore.com. You can visit our website at etfstore.com, uh, or you can message us through Twitter. All right, we're going to start the show this week with our market update. And now it's time for this week's market update. Tune in every week as the ETF Store brings you the information you need to know on the financial markets. Stocks were down last week. The S&P 500 dropped one and a third percent. The Dow Jones Industrial Average closed down nearly one percent. And the Nasdaq declined over one percent for the week. Escalating tensions with North Korea were probably the biggest driver in the financial markets last week. Uh, we saw President Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un continue to engage in a war of words. And that certainly put some investors on edge. On Tuesday, uh, President Trump had this to say in response to continued threats from North Korea. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. He has been very threatening uh, beyond a normal statement. And as I said, they will be met with fire, fury, and frankly, power 
the likes of which this world has never seen before. Thank you. Thank you. And then after actually taking a little bit of criticism that perhaps that language was too strong, uh, on Thursday, President Trump followed up with these comments. And frankly, uh, the people that were questioning that statement, was it too tough? Maybe it wasn't tough enough. (laughs) They've been doing this to our country for a long time, for many years. And it's about time that somebody stuck up for the people of this country and for the people of other countries. So uh, if anything, maybe that statement wasn't tough enough. And we're backed by 100 percent by our military. We're backed by everybody. And we're backed by many other leaders. And I noticed that many senators and others today came out very much in favor of what I said. But if anything, that statement may not be tough enough. What would be tougher than All right, Jason. Then on uh, Friday, President Trump tweeted out that, uh, quote, military solutions are now fully in place, locked and loaded. Should North Korea act unwisely? Uh, hopefully, Kim Jong-un will find another path, uh, exclamation point. Look, we always try to steer clear of talking politics on this show. And I, I think depending upon your view of the world, you may like these comments or you may be appalled at these comments from President Trump. But our job is to look at this from an investment standpoint. And purely from that perspective, this is a classic case where this rhetoric creates some uncertainty. Right. It creates some doubt as to how the situation might be resolved. And when you get heightened uncertainty in the markets, volatility starts to pick up and some investors begin turning towards safe havens. If you look last week, the volatility index, the VIX, it spiked over 50 percent. Gold was up two and a half percent. And as I mentioned earlier, stocks were down across the board. Investors tend to get nervous when geopolitical tensions spike. On the surface, when two nuclear powers butt heads, um, you know, it can be unnerving, I think, especially for the people who live in Guam. This is for whatever, yeah, no doubt. For whatever reason, that's been the, the target du jour. But, you know, I, I know that the, the, the VIX has picked up a tad, but I find it remarkable how resilient markets have actually been in the face of all of this uncertainty and, and the Twitter storm and, and the international hubbub. Um, you know, certainly last week's returns, you know, it weren't unicorns and rainbows. It was kind of a rough week, especially on, at the tail end of the week. Um, but, you know, for a variety of reasons, overall, investors are really hanging in there. And you have to wonder, you know, what's behind some of that? Is it the faith in the government? Is it faith in the, the economy and growth? Or is it faith, faith in the uh, Fed put, you know, that perceived, uh, you know, we're, we'll come to the rescue if markets tank? I don't know. But, uh, you know. I, my common sense would have thought there would be more volatility than there actually was. No, you're right. I think that's a good point. Investors do seem to be hanging in there right now overall. Uh, but clearly, some other investors are taking a different approach. If you look at the VIX and, and gold and stocks last week, and I think really the question here is, should you be making any changes to your portfolio based on a potential conflict with North Korea? And on that note, I want to reference some data because we have the luxury of looking back in history and seeing how stocks have reacted to past conflicts. I actually referenced this data earlier in the year after the airstrikes in Syria. But Ben Carlson, he's the excellent writer. Uh, He has a blog, A Wealth of Common Sense. He he writes for Bloomberg View. He put together some tremendous data on how markets have reacted to past geopolitical crises. And I think these may raise a few eyebrows if you haven't heard these before. I think these are pretty incredible data points. From the start of World War I in 1914 until it ended in 1918, the Dow Jones was up more than 43% in total. From the start of World War II in 1939 until it ended in 1945, the Dow Jones was up 50%. The Korean War from 1950 to 1953, the Dow was up close to 60%. Vietnam from 1965 through 1973, stocks were up over 40%. Uh, The year of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Dow was up more than 10%. And really, we could keep going uh, here from the 9-11 terrorist attacks uh, to the most recent Iraq war. uh, Stocks ultimately ended up. Uh, Really, the biggest sustained drop came uh, with the first goal for 1990. The S&P fell nearly 20%. uh, But we should note that also coincided with an economic recession. So, Jason, the point here is that tinkering with your portfolio based on geopolitical events hasn't been the greatest idea in the past. Now, we don't want to paint this data in the wrong fashion, right? We're not saying stocks are going to go up if there's some sort of conflict with North Korea. 
But historically, stock investors have usually been better off staying put during times of war. It's absolutely counterintuitive. But, you know, I get it. With with these kind of geopolitical events, it's easy to get emotional. You know, we're all human. And especially when the message is loud and available 24-7 online and with the Twitter feed in real time, you know, it's hard to not have the exposure just 24-7 of what's going on in the world. Now, right, Nate, to be clear, we're not saying investors should put on blinders and ignore the world around them. You know, if investors haven't taken a hard look at their holdings and their risk profile and the time frame, it's, tarp- it's time to sharpen the pencil and get to work. But that's much different than you know a knee-jerk reaction to the headline of the day. You know, from a high level, what makes this situation a little more comp- uh, complicated is that you're right, the growing perception that U.S. stock market valuations may be at the high range, may be very high. There's a lot of debate on the subject. So, and, and you know, it, where are returns moving forward going to come from? If the market's richly valued, we know where interest rates are at. You know, there, that's a real conundrum. So you toss in this potential valuation concern into the geopolitical hopper, and you have quite a brew there to stir. Well, let's talk a little bit more about that, because uh, when you talk about growing concerns over stock valuations, I don't think there's any question uh, current valuations may be magnifying geopolitical concerns for some investors. Uh, There has been a growing camp of investors pointing to higher than average stock valuations as uh, perhaps some sort of indicator that the market is going to decline. Uh, Last week, Jeff Gunlock, uh, the so-called bond king, He was the latest high-profile investor to sound the alarm on stocks. Uh, Bloomberg reported that he recently purchased put options on the S&P 500. So those go up in value if the S&P 500 declines by a certain amount. And uh, Gunlock also said his highest conviction trade right now is an increase in volatility. Uh, He also said investors should be, quote, gradualistically moving towards the exits. Jeff Gunlock uh, actually appeared on CNBC last week. I pulled a, a short clip here. Take a listen to this. But I believe that the market will drop 3% at a minimum sometime between now and December from, from what's a, now a grinding, grindingly higher level. And when it does, I think the VIX will not be at 10 or 10 and a half. It was actually below 10. It, it's at 982 but, as we're having this conversation. If you, it's been remarkable. There you go. It, it truly has. There you go. Well, that's that's because you got the Dow up 10 days in a row, which is getting a lot of attention. But uh, other indices aren't really making much progress. But anyway, my point is that when we get whatever correction is coming, and obviously after 10 up days, it would be completely normal to have a couple of down days that may be equate to 3%. If that happens, I think the VIX will easily go to 20. Now, look, a 3% drop is certainly nothing to be concerned about. Right. That's pretty normal, even in a healthy bull market. But, Jason, you can hear the more cautious tone there. He said, quote, when we get whatever correction is coming. That's certainly not a bullish stance. Uh, Now, to be fair, we should mention uh, it wasn't in that clip, but Jeff Gunlock did say his put option purchase is more of a play on volatility increasing than necessarily a bearish view he has on the market. But, But when he's talking about, quote, gradualistically moving towards the exits, that just doesn't give you a real warm and fuzzy uh, around stocks. Uh, another high-profile uh, investor striking uh, more of a cautionary tone on stocks is Howard Marks, uh, who is the co-chairman of Oak Tree Capital. Listen to what he says about stocks and, and bonds and valuations. This was also from CNBC last week. And there's nothing that's cheap today. You know, there's nothing that cries out and says, buy me. Uh, it, it, it may be fairly priced stock market, bond market. It may be rich. Nobody argues that it's cheap. And by the way, I've heard people arguing on your show and others in response to the memo, it's overpriced. No, it's not overpriced. Oh, that's what makes a market. But no, I didn't hear anybody say it's underpriced. Right. And Uh, and, and if that's true, then shouldn't you do something about that? And I want to focus on his last line there. He said, shouldn't you do something about that? Uh, Referring to your portfolio. And Jason, let's focus on that because Fidelity recently reported that 401k balances are now at record highs, which makes sense because we've been in an eight plus year bull market, but that also means more money at risk. And so if we sort of pull this all together, we have geopolitical tensions, concerns over stock valuations and investment accounts at all time highs. I think some investors are saying maybe now is the time to take some money off the table. 
Now, we gave you some data earlier on stocks and geopolitical events. Let's talk a little bit about valuations. And this is also something we'll discuss here in a few moments with uh, Wisdom Tree's Jeremy Schwartz. The challenge with valuations is they don't tell you anything about the when. In other words, stocks can stay overvalued for extended periods of time. Just because valuations are high, that doesn't mean stocks are going to decline. It's a real conundrum because the first reaction to a highly, richly valued market is, "Boy, I better, I better do something." And, and that when you know it, it's it is it is very very difficult. The entire investment community struggles with that. Now, I will I'll, I'll go out on a limb and say, at least I think it's a fair assumption that in the future U.S. stock market returns may be a little less or a lot less, depending on what happens, than their historical averages when looked at over a five or ten or twelve year period of time. And no one would like to be wrong more than me on this. But when you look at high starting valuations, potentially, that speaks to lower future returns. It's just math. It's just probability. That's my take. You know, what should investors be doing now? Let me offer just a couple of quick su suggestions. I think you first start with the block and tackling, the basics of portfolio construction. What do you own right now? And what are the relative valuations, not only to their own historical norms, but in a cross-sectional basis, taking a look at different asset classes? Where should you be trimming or pruning your portfolio? You know, we're all five years older today than we were five years ago. We're all closer to the finish line. That's something to think about. I think some simple things we need to consider, number one, is saving more money. You know, if we have lower future returns over the next five to 10 years, those of us, you know, 50 to 65, nearing that finish line for retirement, have to, have to consider the possibility that a greater portion of that pie at the end will be principal, not growth on principal. Well, and we always talk about when you look at the markets, saving more money is something you can actually control. You can't control what's going to happen in the markets. You can't control how the markets are going to react to, to current valuations, but you can control how much money you save. Absolutely. You know, I think it's important. And, you know, some economists may not want to hear that. But for a lot of us trying to move forward, we need to learn to defer a little bit of gratification. Maybe that purchase next year can be in two years. Lastly, two final ones, higher level ones. With the with the advances we see in anti aging therapies and and uh, gene editing and a whole host of things to extend healthy lifespans, many investors ought to think about working a little longer. They don't have to tap that nest egg for a year or two or three. That's certainly something again we can all control. And then lastly, more technical, when we run social security optimizations for our clients, in many cases it's possible or if it's possible to defer electing social security, it makes a lot of sense. So again, things we can control, working longer, saving more money, deferring social security, if you try to do some heavy lifting there, chances are you'll be much better off in the long run. Well, and we need to take a break here, but something you alluded to earlier when you're talking about pruning your portfolio and looking at, at the valuations of the different asset classes uh, was diversifying away high valuations, right? One potential way you can do that is by investing internationally. Uh, for some investors, you may have a home country bias. And so you may be overweighted to an area that has a higher probability of lower future returns. Well, one thing you can do is look to areas that perhaps have a higher probability of higher future returns. And you can make the case that uh, international stocks might offer just that. Uh, let's actually take a break here. And when we come back, we'll be joined by Wisdom Tree's Jeremy Schwartz. We'll get his thoughts on current U.S. stock valuations. Uh, but then we'll spend the bulk of our time discussing international stocks and uh, valuations. And we'll also highlight a few Wisdom Tree ETFs. We'll do that right after the break. You're listening to the ETF Store Show. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show, Nature Racing, Jason Lincoln Studio. I'm now very pleased to have joining us on the program, Jeremy Schwartz, Director of Research at Wisdom Tree. Wisdom Tree is a top 10 ETF provider. And as I mentioned earlier, Jeremy is simply a tremendous all-around resource on the financial markets. As a matter of fact, 
Jeremy actually hosts his own radio program on Wharton Business Radio on Sirius XM. It's called Behind the Markets. He hosts that with a renowned economic and market expert, Professor Siegel. But Jeremy is well-schooled in both the financial markets and certainly ETFs, and we're very happy to have him joining us via phone today from London, where he's currently traveling on business. Uh, Jeremy, as always, great to have you on the program. Neat, thanks for having me. Jeremy, our focus today is going to be on international stocks, but I thought we might first start by briefly touching on U.S. stocks. And in our first segment, Jason and I mentioned that while valuation metrics are rather poor market timing tools, they are pretty good indicators on the probability of future returns. And right now, U.S. stocks are valued on the higher side. I'm curious, what's your overall assessment of U.S. stocks, and are you concerned at all about valuations? Well, it's very important to connect your average valuation of the market with some of the long-term forward-looking real returns. Uh, you know, and I've worked with Professor Siegel for about 15 years now, and he always likes to point out when he goes to his long-term studies, stocks for the long run, he has a 200-year data set that says stocks real return has been 6.5% over these long-term time periods. Bond real returns in the U.S. have been around 3.5% over long-term periods. So you had this 3% equity premium. Uh, now, where do we get 6.5% as a long-term real return? There's a very important relationship with the P.E. ratio, which over long periods of time is average 15. And so if you do 1 divided by 15, you get that 6.5% as your after-inflation real return for the market. So where are you on P.E. ratios today? I see an S&P 500 P.E. ratio of approximately 20 which gives you an earnings yield of 5. Um, now, so a 5% real return, you add 2% for inflation, maybe gives you a 7% nominal return over longer periods, call it a 5- to 10-year forward-looking horizon. You know, what is more expensive, I think, is actually the bond yields, where, you know, you go back to that 200 years, 3.5% was your average real return. Today, the 10-year TIPS bond only yields 50 basis points. So you have a 3% below your long-term average bond return when stocks – you know, below their average return, maybe 1.5% below their normal return. So it's really bonds that are much more expensive than stocks. But that's that whole search for yield, given that there's really not a lot of alternatives out there, that is one of the reasons why, you know, pressuring up U.S. stock valuations. Uh, Jeremy, putting valuations aside, what keeps you up at night as you think about the U.S. market? Is it geopolitical risk? Is it concerns over what the Trump administration may or may not be able to get accomplished? Is it whether earnings growth can continue? What gives you the most heartburn? No, I think those are the three major things that are impacting the market today. You hit on all of them. Um, I think, you know, last year at the end of the year, you, there was prospects for tax reform. People thought Trump would be a positive for lowering corporate tax rates. Uh, we haven't seen any action there. Um, I think I still think people... Are, are discounting that the Republicans will get their act together, and, and, and you know, there's probably not a lot of expectations for them to, to do that today, given they haven't really accomplished a lot yet. Um, if, if all those prospects completely disappeared and they really didn't get any tax reform, that would be one of the big disappointments. But the, the thing supporting the market has been earnings growth this year. Now, where did that earnings growth come from? You know, the two or three years ago, we, we were having a very strong dollar environment, and that has been a headwind for U.S. earnings. We have a lot of our earnings, half our earnings really come from abroad. And so this year, you're seeing the reverse side of that. A weak dollar has helped a lot of the U.S. earnings. And so that's been one of the things leading to positive earnings surprises. Um, so I think you definitely need earnings to, to stay in there. Um, it would be very helpful if you had tax reform. Uh, you, you've seen regulations being cut, and that's very positive for, for small cap companies, which have really been underperforming on the strong dollar, and we haven't seen the, real, the corporate tax reform yet. Um, but you really do want to see the Republicans move along corporate tax reform. That's been one of the things that the market was very positive on at the end of last year, uh, and, and I'm hopeful that they do get their act together towards the end of this year. Our guest today is Jeremy Schwartz, Director of Research at Wisdom Tree. Uh, Jeremy, let's now pivot to international stocks. And going back to valuations on a relative basis, international stocks do appear more attractively valued right now, in particular emerging market stocks. As a matter of fact, I saw in a recent blog uh, post at wisdomtree.com that over the past 20 years, there have been 61 instances where the valuation gap between the MSCI Emerging Markets Index and the S&P 500 has been as large as where it currently stands, obviously with the S&P valued on the high side. In 54 of those instances, 
emerging markets outperform the S&P 500 over the next five years, and pretty significantly so. What's your take on emerging markets right now? No, I think you hit on the valuation case. Um, I think when you look around the world, the lowest P ratios we have on, on any index could be found in, in emerging markets today. We have a high dividend emerging market index, and you know the P ratios on that basket are about 10 times earnings. So we talked about the 20 times earnings on the S&P 500. This has a 10 times P ratio, so a 10% earnings yield, a, a 5% dividend yield on the underlying stocks. Now, when you, when you go to emerging markets, you do have higher levels of risk. You do have currency risk. You do have commodity orientation. Um, you'll have you know, countries that are in the news all the time, like Russia. That will become big parts of your, your basket so, in, in some of these strategies. So it definitely does not come with the same level of risk as a U.S. market index. But if you, you know, want to try to find where are you being rewarded or where are the valuations low, um, you know, that high dividend emerging market index is really one of the, the better places to find those type of valuation opportunities. Jeremy, you mentioned uh, potentially higher levels of risk, and, and certainly in individual countries like Russia. How should investors approach emerging markets? Is, is it better to hold broad-based emerging market ETFs, or should investors target individual country ETFs, or is it a combination of the two? What do you think the best approach is? It really comes down to style preferences and what you're trying to achieve. I mean, I think the end of the, you know, when you think about what the, the typical investor profile looks like, most people have this home country bias. Well, there'll be 80% or more in the U.S. When a globally diversified market portfolio, you could just buy one ETF or one strategy and basically buy the world. That would have approximately 50% in the U.S., 50% outside the U.S., and call it a little bit less than 10% in the emerging markets. So you can be very simply allocated with just one ETF to cover the world, or you can say, I want to overweight certain regions, I want to overweight countries, or I want to have a certain style tilt when I go towards these strategies. Um, if, I, if you're looking at a country level, I think as a long-term one of the better stories for emerging markets from a demographic perspective, you say, I want the growth profile of these young people around the world. Where are they doing some most interesting things around the world? India is one country that stands out. Um, you know, we have a fund EPI. That's the broadest way of getting exposure to India, real local economy, not just exporting to the, to the world. It's really focused on more local consumption. And, you know, they have a prime minister, Modi, who's doing a lot of things from a technology perspective that's really – leapfrogged a lot of where we are in the U.S., where you can open a bank account with your fingerprint, you get your medical records with a fingerprint. They're going towards getting rid of cash in their society in a way to get rid of corruption. Um, it's, it's a really forward-thinking economy there. So if I had to say you're picking one country for the next five years in emerging markets, I think India is really one I would stand out. But a lot of people don't want to do just countries, and they want to have a broad, diversified strategy. And that's where I think you look at either like a value-oriented strategy with our, our high dividend approach or some things they just get you very differentiated exposures to the emerging markets. Jeremy, this is Jason Lang. I'd like to talk with you about one of the challenges out there for investing internationally for portfolio managers like Wisdom Tree, and that's the subject of capital controls. And you know, certainly China comes to mind with different share classes, investing through Hong Kong versus mainland, you know, where the government you know, will freely inter inter intervene in currency or capital markets. As an investor, what are some of the challenges there, and what, what can be done about that? Yeah, no, and you bring up a very interesting point, because in the news this morning, and specifically with respect to China, um, you know, the state has been involved in a lot of the companies, and they're large shareholders in a lot of the companies and, and the banks uh, in particular, but really throughout the Chinese economy. And the state's actually getting more involved in some of the Hong Kong companies, and people are worried, is the state going to run these companies for shareholders' interests or for the government's interests? Uh, and that did lead to a discussion as we were looking at just China and just emerging markets generally. In addition to value factors like a dividend yield or a P ratio, we did create these series of indexes that would remove state ownership. And you can think of this as you know, an ESG index focusing on the G in, in ESG, the governance angle, of trying to just focus on – on non-state ownership, um, and an example like China, where more than half the market, if you look in a traditional cap-weighted index, you could get 70% or more in state-run banks and energy companies. When you remove those banks and energy companies, you really get through the future of China, the, 
you know, the Alibabas, the ten cents of the world that are really tech and consumer oriented. So you get a really different look and feel for what the Chinese economy looks like. So if I'm saying for a long run exposure to China, I think there's certainly my preference would be this ex state ownership route, but you could also apply it to a broad emerging market basket as well. Uh, it's sort of really the opposite of a value strategy. They're going to have higher valuations because it's really more tech and consumer oriented than something like the high dividend strategy I talked about before. Um, but they're both you know, I think really good long run ways of getting access to emerging markets. Jeremy, let's talk a little bit more about that, because in terms of broad emerging market strategies, as you've mentioned, Wisdom Tree does offer a number of options, both on the style tilt side, as well as unique ways of accessing emerging market stocks, ex state owned enterprises. Uh, you know, you have a very popular dividend weighted ETF, the Wisdom Tree Emerging Markets High Dividend ETF. Uh, ticker DEM. Uh, there is the Wisdom Tree Emerging Markets X State Owned Enterprise ETF, ticker symbol XSOE. There's a Quality Dividend Growth ETF, DGRE. From a retail investor's perspective, what are some of the key considerations in determining the right strategy? Because I, I do think it can be a bit confusing. No, this is absolutely why I think a lot of um, individuals, even though there's, you could say the ETF makes democratizes the idea and brings it out to the masses, there's still a lot of need for financial advisors to come in and help people structure portfolios and figure out where in these worlds do people want to be, be invested. So that's absolutely you know, something that we see a lot of people, people use advisors to help them make these type of decisions. Um, I think the, you know, when, when I think about the long run merits of both strategies and really high dividends in some ways is the opposite side of state owned today, um, in sort of ex state owned. Ex state owned will tilt you towards this longer term consumer and technology trend versus DEM, the high dividend strategy, is really a value strategy, really a deep value strategy, and you will get more Chinese financials, you will get more energy companies. And, you know, the long term research, the academics have said value has been one of the best consistent Long-term strategy of the last 50 years, Professor Siegel has done a lot of work on high dividend yield sorts of the market. You know, and we do believe in value investing for the long run. Um, you know, but if you're thinking about also these long-term trends, you know, the growth of the EM consumer is a important one. And so this technology shift that we're seeing in the U.S., you see it with the Amazons and, and Facebooks and, and all these tech companies. Well, applying that towards the emerging markets gets you in this ex-state ownership type um, type strategy. So I think those are the two real sort of opposite sides of the market. Say whether you want a sort of deeper value, just buy me the cheapest part of the world. The cheapest parts of the world today is DEM. If you say I want that long-term orientation with the sort of growth of the middle class, the growth of the technology area within China, within India, and all these other countries, I think the ex-state ownership theme is actually a very good one. Our guest today is Jeremy Schwartz, Director of Research at Wisdom Tree. Uh, Jeremy, I want to make sure we spend at least a few minutes on developed international stocks as well, in particular Europe and Japan. Uh, valuations maybe aren't quite as attractive here as in emerging markets, but they are cheaper than U.S. stocks. And performance has been pretty good uh, overall this year. Are you positive on both of these areas, and are they more attractive than the U.S. right now? Well, if you go back to my opening model, the, the stock versus bond model, and we had a 5% earnings yield on the S&P 500, and call it the, the, the 10-year tips is 50 basis points, but our nominal bond is, say, two and a quarter. So you have about a 275 nominal yield uh, advantage. If you go to Japan, you know, the Fed is starting to normalize its balance sheet, whatever that means, but they're going to start to let their balance sheet run down from $4.5 trillion. The Bank of Japan is going to be by far the outlier. They've said, we're going to cap our 10-year bond at zero, and I think they're going to be the last to normalize their balance sheet. So if you look at their 10-year bond at zero, our 10-year bond at 220, their P ratio on our Japan index, our, our sort of flagship exporters oriented index, has a 12 to 13 PE. So you're getting an 8% earnings yield. And so that gap is 8% because their 10-year bond is zero. So that gap is well, well more than double the, the earnings equity premium in the U.S. So from that stock versus bond model, I'd say Japan is actually perhaps the most attractive market in the marketplace today. Um, now, that's obviously going to be very tied to global growth. It's very tied to the U.S. It's very tied to China. It's very tied to what the yen does and what interest rates do. Um, so it's not a, you know, a, for the faint of heart. There is, Japan comes with a higher degree of risk than, say, the U.S. But it, from the valuation perspective, I do think it is one of the more interesting places. Uh, and Europe is in between. Europe, you get about 15 PEs, so call it 6% earnings yield. Germany's 10-year bond yields are negative. So, again, you're going to get double the equity premium over 
on stocks versus bonds compared to the U.S. So again, I think you would say German or just the broad European indexes are attractive versus bonds and, and still on a valuation basis, certainly versus the U.S. as well. Jeremy, Wisdom Tree's two largest ETFs actually cover Europe and Japan. The Europe Hedged Equity ETF, HEDJ, and the Japan Hedged Equity ETF, DXJ. These both hold dividend-paying companies with an exporting tilt, but they hedge against a decline in the euro and yen, respectively. The U.S. dollar has weakened this year, so the hedge has been a bit of a headwind in terms of performance. Can you talk a little bit more about these two ETFs, and what should the decision-making process be for an investor between currency hedged and unhedged? Yeah, and this is you know one of the first things we, as an ETF provider, we were the first firm to start talking about currency hedging, and you know I've, I've been I've been writing recently that I think currency hedging has a branding problem, that we can't go back and change history, that we can't relabel funds, but if I used to call your international equity fund your international double decker fund, which is your stock plus currency fund. How many people really want the stock plus currency fund? Would you really want that as your default? My hypothesis is people wouldn't buy the double-decker fund. They'd buy the single-decker fund. They'd buy the stocks. Uh, and the question is, why should you always be long the euro? Why should you always be long the yen? Um, there's no model to me that says the euro is always going to go up in value or that the yen is always going to go up in value. Sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. Three years pre- preceding this year, we had a strong dollar environment. This year, we have a weak dollar environment. Um, so... To me, you shouldn't be unhedged all the time. That's the one thing you shouldn't be doing. Um, perhaps you could argue for fully hedging a broader national basket. That will help you lower volatility on a broader national ba- basis. Um, our newest innovation about a year and a half ago, we launched a dynamically hedged index, and we launched this in five different regions. But our, our broad-based international DDWM, um, so dynamic DWM, is, is our is our latest. That's really a broad EFA-like universe for the full developed world, and that's getting a lot of traction, but that will adjust the hedge ratios once a month based on a currency factor model, looking at things like the, the trend in currencies, the momentum, uh, the valuations of currencies, and then a carry factor, the interest rate differentials. And that dynamic factor model, we believe, will add value over being hedged and unhedged together. And so today, roughly, that model is 50-50, but it will range from, you know, a low of being a hedged on a third on the euro, a high on the yen, and, you know, half hedged on the pound. So those are three big currencies. Um, but that will adjust once a month based on those, that three-factor model, and hopefully that becomes a, a smart hedging program that will help people do it for them. But the one thing I encourage people, the only thing I say you shouldn't be is be unhedged all the time. Um, and hopefully either our dynamic hedging or the, the fully hedged to help lower volatility is, is one of the things to think about. Jeremy, certainly Wisdom Tree is a thought leader in the, the currency and hedging space. Let me throw you a curveball, and that curveball is Bitcoin. Uh, Bit- Bitcoin's been called the next cryptocurrency, a mode of exchange and investment, all kinds of things, and it's hard to get your head around. But is it possible we see Bitcoin in a hedging strategy? Just Just high level, your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's been indexes that you know the one index I've seen, and there's probably some some funds out there that might track this, like a gold hedge S and P 500 fund, which is you know um, one way. You know, to the extent that people start buying things in Bitcoin, um, you know, you could say perhaps whether they have a raw pure Bitcoin, just exposure to the Bitcoins. I mean, we do have currency funds, raw exposure to currencies. And so the extent that Bitcoin is another currency, whether it's like the euro, the yen, or some people think of gold as a currency, yes, I think people will have those. Whether or not you want to hedge a index, you know, it's really not a hedge per se. It's really what I would call the double-decker fund, where it's giving you exposure to an asset class plus the Bitcoin return. Um, so that, you know, it's all how, how you frame it. But, um, you know, we'll have to see how that market develops and see if that becomes a, a more meaningful thing for people. Jeremy, we have about two minutes left here before we let you go. Occasionally, we'll hear some investors question the value of owning international stocks in a portfolio. And we tend to hear two main pushbacks. The first is that large cap U.S. companies are so global in nature now. They derive such a large portion of revenue and earnings overseas. They're effectively proxies for international exposure. And then the second is that the global economy is so interconnected now that if U.S. stocks tank or we have a recession, international stocks are going to be negatively impacted as well. They're essentially tied together at the hip. So what's the point of owning them? How would you address those two concerns? Well, in, in a way, 
one of the concerns, and it's interesting, Jack Bogle, you know, the founders of Vanguard, always said, I only buy the U.S., and one of his first lines in talking about that is, well, you, you consume in dollars, you don't need these foreign currencies. Say, so, hey, Jack, we created something that you don't need to take this foreign currency risk. Your assets and liabilities are mashed together. You only have U.S. dollar risk when you hedge the currency. So that was one of his objections, which I think is very easily overcomable today. Um, but just like you wouldn't say, well, I'm going to sort the S&P 500 and buy companies that start with the letter A to M, why am I going to sort the world and say I'm just going to buy half the market? Um, you are missing half the market out there. And, and, yes, there are times when the S&P outperforms the rest of the world. The last decade is such a time. But that's also why probably now is the time you need to look at international the, more, but the most is when they've underperformed by so much it perhaps is a time to consider them even more because the valuations have improved and valuations are critically tied to future returns. So I, I'd say I hear that concern, and you do get global footprints from U.S. companies. It's absolutely true. But just, uh, you know, you buy a European company, it has, it has footprints to the U.S., it has footprints to the emerging markets. You buy Japan, and I actually think a lot of the Japanese multinationals, Toyota's, it's more about the U.S. than it is Japan. And so, you know, you, you can even get back to U.S. exposure from these foreign companies. So um, I, I just say, you know, why do you make a big bet on the U.S. outperforming the rest of the world? That may not always be the case. Well, Jeremy, with that, we'll have to leave it there. As always, just a pleasure having you on the program. We greatly appreciate your time today. And safe travels back to the U.S. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. A pleasure being with you guys. That was Jeremy Schwartz, Director of Research at Wisdom Tree. And you can learn more about the Wisdom Tree ETF lineup by visiting wisdomtree.com. Let's take a quick break, and when we come back, Jason and I are going to spotlight two additional Wisdom Tree ETFs, one offering exposure to China and the other to India. We'll do that right after the break. This is the ETF Store Show. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show. Nate and Jason in studio. Let's go right to our ETF Spotlight. It's time for the ETF Spotlight, where each week the ETF Store highlights one exchange-traded fund. There are over 2,000 ETFs available for you to choose from. The ETF Store sorts through and investigates them all so you don't have to. We're actually spotlighting two ETFs this week. The first is the Wisdom Tree China X state owned Enterprise ETF, ticker symbol CXSE. This also happens to be Wisdom Tree's top performing ETF year to date. It's up close to 50%. This ETF holds approximately 70 Chinese companies where the government owns less than 20%. And the idea here is that companies not owned by the communist Chinese government are going to have a much greater opportunity for growth and profitability. Uh, you also find that government-owned companies tend to be focused in uh, energy and the banking sector and some infrastructure like telecom, uh, which I wouldn't necessarily call bastions of growth. Uh, so by excluding state-owned enterprises, there's a strong tilt in this ETF towards consumer discretionary and technology. Uh, each of these are about 30% of the ETF's holdings. Uh, you have names like Alibaba, Baidu, Tencent, NetEase, JD.com. Uh, these are really where China's growing consumer class uh, is spending their money right now. Uh, so, Jason, this ETF could potentially be a better way to access China's growth. Uh, and I should note that Wisdom Tree recently announced they're adding China A shares uh, to this ETF's holdings as well, about 5% of the total exposure. Yeah, I mean, the bottom line thesis for this particular ETF is that you know nearly 70% of the companies in China have a very large percentage of government ownership. They call them SOEs, or state-owned enterprises. And frankly, um, some of these companies are more instruments of government policy than they are run for the the purpose of enhancing shareholder value. You know, is that where you want to invest? So if you believe in the demographic growth story of China, you want to own companies where the influence of the government in the ruling, you know, the single ruling party is less. This is a way to do it. All right. And then quickly here, the other ETF we want to highlight is the Wisdom Tree India Earnings ETF, ticker symbol EPI. This is the ETF that Jeremy Schwartz mentioned earlier. This holds about 250 stocks of companies incorporated and traded in India. And what's interesting about this ETF is that it only holds profitable companies, and it selects and weights those companies based on earnings. Uh, there's also an adjustment for foreign investment limitations. Uh, but simply put, companies that have a higher net income, are going to have a larger weighting in the CTF. If you look at the top sectors currently represented, 25% of EPI's holdings are financials, 
22% energy and 17% information technology. Uh, this is an unhedged ETF, so you do have currency exposure to the rupee. Uh, and Jason, uh, what you end up with here is a bit of a value tilt mm-hmm. compared to the most popular India ETF, which is the iShares MSCI India ETF, uh, because obviously you're weighting holdings based on net profits and, and not, uh, not market cap. And that also tends to lead to some small cap exposure in EPI as well, uh, which the iShares ETF does not have. Well, also, I, th- I think the story with these both of these two ETFs is the demographics. You know, the, the China ETF we just spoke to, you know, the world's most populous country. Well, India is actually number two with over a billion people. And what I find really interesting is that India is the fourth largest economy in the world. And I think you've asked a man on the street, you know, give me the top four or five biggest economies. You'd get China. You'd get United States. You know, someone with their head in the markets would say Japan. But I don't know how many people would actually say India. But what makes it interesting to me is that when it comes to purchasing power parity, you know, that GDP, that, that economic growth divided by the number of people, India is only 159th from a ranking sp- uh, statistic, which means there's such a huge runway for potential growth. You know, every human being in that country, if they were just to double what they're what they're earning from a very low base, you could see tremendous growth. So it's it, again, it has some parallels to the China ETF we spoke to, primarily the de- the demographics. But uh, India is on a growth trajectory. I don't think there's any question about it. Well, you know, something that uh, a word that you mentioned several times there was growth. Yep. And you know, just at a high level, we've talked a lot about valuations today uh, around the world. Uh, but one reason to own emerging markets is the potential upside growth. Now, as we discussed with Jeremy earlier, there are risks there. Sure. Uh, you know, emerging markets are going to be more volatile. But when you think about having some opportunity for upside potential in your portfolio, especially in light of valuations around the world, if, if you think U.S. stocks are on the high side. Uh, and, you know, I, I thought Jeremy laid out a great uh, case for Japan. Uh, earlier, but if you think developed international, you know I think it's certainly more attractive than the U.S., but not nearly as attractive as emerging markets. And so, you know, here are two ETFs that if you want to get a little more targeted in your exposure and and not use the broad based emerging market ETFs, this can be a way to to pinpoint that exposure. I think one of the other compelling factors for this India ETF, it's really gone under the radar, is that the current government of India is very progressive, and they've made changes to markets and particularly the currency. India has traditionally been a cash economy, and there are problems with that when you're trying to grow uh, GDP. And so they've instituted some changes. And so that's compelling. There, there are a lot of neat reasons to look to India for growth. Yeah. So again, those two ETFs are the Wisdom Tree China X State Owned Enterprise ETF and the Wisdom Tree India Earnings ETF. That is all the time we have for today's show. Podcasts of the ETF Store Show are available at ETFstore.com, Apple iTunes, and Google Play. Connect with us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can stay up to date on all the latest from both the ETF Store and the ETF Store Show. Next week, Christian Magoon, CEO of Amplify ETFs and a well-respected ETF veteran, will spotlight the recently launched Amplify Yield Shares Oil Hedged MLP Income ETF. And then we'll also switch gears and discuss the Amplify Online Retail ETF, which has been one of the better performing ETFs this year. Until then, have a great week, everyone. Oh,